Catholic Apologetics Today, Part 7 Chapter 23 Other Sheep I Have There are many non-Christian religions and philosophies that have numerous followers in the world, yet there is not one of them that would even attempt to give it a carefully worked out rational basis for its faith, such we have given in the main part of this book. Yes, Muhammad, founder of Islam, claimed to be a prophet, but he did not even try to prove it by miracles, worked in the connected framework we saw for the miracles and to prove Jesus was a messenger sent by God. Nor is there any such thing as an Islamic Lourdes, a center where miracles still happen, which are meticulously checked by the best resources of modern science. Only the Catholic Church can and does claim such proven wonders. Another question can and must be raised about these sects. St. Paul in Romans chapter 3 verse 29 asked, Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Paul meant that if we say that one could only be saved by keeping the law of Moses, then what of the countless people who have never heard of Moses? Did God desert them? as if they were not their God at all. St. Paul says that he is their God too, for he has provided for salvation by faith. We recall the meaning of that expression in chapter 18. Clearly, we have to ask the same question about the millions who have never heard of Christianity. Is God not their God too? With Paul we say, of course he is. But here we must carefully distinguish two things, the fact that it is true and how this is accomplished. The fact that God makes salvation possible for them is beyond doubt. Just how it is done is a different question. As to the facts that it is true, Pope Pius IX taught, God, who clearly sees, examines, and knows the minds, thoughts, souls, and attitudes of all, in his supreme goodness definitely does not allow anyone to be punished with eternal punishments who does not have the guilt of voluntary fault. When Father Leonard Feeney said that all who did not have their names in a parish register were lost, Pope Pius XII directed the Holy Office to condemn his error. In its declaration, the Holy Office quoted from the mystical body encyclical of Pius XII, saying people can be saved who are ordered to the church by a sort of unrecognized by them desire and wish. Vatican II taught the same concept. They who, without their own fault, do not know the gospel of Christ and his church but yet seek God with a sincere heart, and try, with the help of grace, to carry out his will, which they know by conscience can detain eternal salvation. This does not mean a person who knows that the church has been founded by Jesus as the means to salvation can choose merely to obey the moral law and ignore the church. Those persons cannot be saved who, while knowing that the Catholic Church was founded by God through Jesus Christ as necessary, still refuse to enter it or to continue in it. Thus, it is certain that these millions who are not officially part of the Church are not excluded from eternal salvation. But, as we said, just how this works out in practice is another question. Pius XII made clear that in some way people can, by implicit desire, which they themselves do not recognize as such, pertain to the church, or be ordered by the church. And so, if they fulfill the moral law as they know it, can be saved. Modern anthropology shows that primitives do know the moral law surprisingly well. In exploring farther, 
we recognize that the Church has not given us more information than what we have just quoted, that, of course, does not forbid us, without denying the Church's word, to add them. To clarify the issue, how can pagans be saved? The question of how pagans are saved presents a puzzle. On the one hand, we have the modern authoritative statements, which we have just quoted. On the other hand, some older texts, which sound contrastingly severe. For example, in the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215 A.D., taught there is one universal church of the faithful, outside of which no one at all is saved. Now, before going ahead, it must be recognized that in matters of divine revelation, we may easily come upon two truths, and both are true, yet we may not be able to see how to reconcile them. We saw examples of this conflict from St. Paul in chapters 19 and 20, and there are more. The way to reconcile seemingly opposite things may be except that we can never resolve them, at least in this life. For example, the mystery of the Blessed Trinity is unsolvable in this life. But in other cases, after some time, the answer may be discovered, as we saw previously. It is of major importance to work using the right method. We must take care not to deny or even to strain the interpretation of either of the two truths. So here we must hold that membership in the church is required, yet that some can be saved who seem not to have that membership. Pope St. Clement I, who was of the same generation at Rome as St. Peter and Paul, wrote in 95 AD to the Church of Corinth, Let us go through all generations and learn that in generation and generation the Master has given a place of repentance for those willing to turn to him. Those who repented their sins appeased God in praying and receiving salvation, even though they were alien to God. Even more striking are the words of St. Justin Martyr, written in his first apology in Rome around 150 A.D. Those who lived according to Logos are Christians, even though they were considered atheists, as among the Greeks, Socrates and Heraclitus. We left the word Logos in Greek because it has several meanings, including word, word of God, and reason. St. Justin seems to mean the Word of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who in the fullness of time took flesh for our salvation. How could Justin say some follow? How could Justin say some followed Christ, the Logos, centuries before his birth? In his second apology, St. Justin explains, Christ was and is the Logos who is in everyone, who foretold through the prophets the things that were to come, and when he became like us in experience, taught these things himself. St. Justin is saying that before the Incarnation, the Divine Word could speak to men, to the Jews, through the prophets, and to outsiders in a purely interior way. Those who followed the word were Christians, even centuries before Christ. St. Justin is elaborating on an idea of St. Paul's found in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, which states, For when the Gentiles who have not the law, do by nature those things that are of the law. These not having the law are a law unto themselves. They show the work 
of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience bears witness to them. And their thoughts in turn will either accusing or even defending them. In the days when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. St. Paul echoes Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 33, where God says, I will put my law within them, and I will write it in their heart. If the Gentiles obey the law written on their hearts, when their consciences will defend them at the judgment, and they will be saved. If we compare these words with, with that of St. Paul added later in Romans chapter 8 verse 9, if Now, if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And we can see that it must be that the Spirit of Christ, the divine logos, the Word writes the law in their hearts. If one does not have and follow the Spirit, he does not belong to Christ, but he does have and follow it, he does belong to Christ. The implications are tremendous, and we will explore them in great detail later. About the same time, St. Justin, a remarkable layman called Hermas, the brother of Pope St. Pius I, wrote a work on the church and the sacrament of penance called The Shepherd. In it, he reports a vision, which perhaps is just a device of the genre in which he was working. In that vision, an old woman appears. An angel asks Hermas, the old woman, who do you think it is? Herman thinks it's a pagan prophetess, a sibyl. But the angel tells him, you are wrong. It is not. Who is it then? Ask Hermas. The angel explains, it is the church. But when Hermas asks why the appearance as an old woman, the angel explains, because she was created first of all, and for this reason she is an old woman. According to this vision, the church has always existed since the beginning. She is the first creation. The same idea exists in a very early sermon from about the time of Hermas, which was once thought to come from Pope St. Clement I. The books of the prophets and the apostles say that the church is not only now, but from the beginning. She was spiritual. She was manifested in the last days to save us. St. Justin had said that some people centuries before Christ were really Christians, since they followed the Logos, the Divine Word, St. Irenaeus, the martyr bishop of Lyon, died 200 A.D., had listened when he was young to St. Polycarp, telling what he in turn had heard from St. John the Apostle himself. St. Irenaeus, Irenaeus wrote, There is one and the same God, the Father, and his Logos, always assisting the human race, with varied arrangements, doing many things and saving from the beginning those who are saved. They are those who love God and follow the Logos of God. The idea that the church is ancient from the beginning of time is put, is put forth by Clement of Alexandria, head of the great catechetal head of the great catechetal school in Alexandria, it is clear that there is some true church, which is really ancient, into which those who are just are enrolled. The next head of the school of Alexandria was Clement's pupil Origen. The pagan Celsus had attacked the church, saying, 
Did God then only, after so long a time, think of making the life of man just, while before he did not care? Origen replied, But he always cared, and gave occasions of virtue to make reasonable things being right. For generation by generation, the wisdom of souls came to souls it found holy, and made them friends of God and the prophets. The objection of Celsus appears again and is answered in the work of Arnobius around 305 AD. Arnobius had long been an opponent of Christianity. When he finally asked for baptism, the bishop was suspicious. To prove his sincerity, Arnobius wrote Against the Nations. In it he said, Put aside these cares and leave the questions you do not know. Royal mercy was imparted to them, and the divine benefits ran equally through all. They were conserved, they were liberated. Not long after Arnobius, a dialogue presented itself as between Manus, fan founder of Manichaeism, and Archelaus, the bith Bishop of Shakar, speaking similarly. Manus had raised the same objection as Celsus. Archela Archelaus replied, from the creation of the world, from the creation of the world, he has always been with just men. We were not just from the fact that they kept the law, each of them showing the work of the law on their hearts, their conscience testifying to them. Archelaus, we easily see, is appealing to Romans chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, which taught the salvation of pagans who followed the law that the Spirit of Christ, the Logos, had made known to them in their hearts. One of the greatest of the Latin fathers, St. Augustine, wrote his Epistle 102 from the beginning of the human race. Whoever believed in him and understood him somewhat and lived according to his precepts, whoever and wherever they may have been, doubtless were saved through him. And again, later, in the same epistle, the salvation of this religion through alone, true salvation is promised truly, was never lacking to anyone who was worthy, and he to whom it was lacking was not worthy. Near the end of his life, when he made a long review of all his works, called retractions, we find this very thing, which is now called Christian religion, existed among the ancients, nor was it lacking from the beginning of the human race until Christ himself came in the flesh, whence the true religion that already existed began to be called Christian. We could quote many more statements from the fathers, but let us be content with brief mention of a few more. St. Gregory of Nazianzus, at the funeral of his father, who had been pagan but died a bishop, said, He was ours even before he was of our fold. St. John Chrysostom interpreted Romans chapter 2 verses 14 through 16 just as we did. Pope St. Leo the Great spoke of Christ establishing one and the same cause of salvation since the foundation of the world. Pope St. Gregory the Great spoke much as did St. Augustine, and in a homily on Ezekiel added, They were then outside, but yet not divided from the Holy Church, because in mind, in work, in preaching, they already held the sacraments of faith and saw that loftiness of holy church. 
although there were outside the church, in that they were not official members, they were not divided from the true church. Finally, an answer. It had been proven that many fathers held that the church existed from the beginning of the human race. Others, like St. Justin, said that some before Christ were really Christians because they followed the Logos, the divine word. So now we ask, in what sense was and is the Logos in each man, so that by listening and obeying, men could be Christians even before Christ? As we hinted above, the answer lies in the great epistle to the Romans. In Romans chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, the Spirit of Christ was sent into the hearts of pagans who had not heard the revealed law of Moses. The Spirit wrote the law on their hearts. Anthropology today says that primitives did and do know the moral law. Those pagans, of course, did not know it was the Spirit of Christ. Yet, objectively, many of them did follow that spirit, and so, objectively, if they complied, they were following the spirit of Christ. We saw further, from chapter 8 of Romans, that those who do not have and follow the spirit do not belong to Christ, but those who do and have followed the spirit of Christ do belong to Christ. Now, in St. Paul's language, to belong to Christ means that a member of the body of Christ, but that body of Christ is the church. Hence, this remarkable conclusion is evident. The good pagans really did belong to Christ, or belonged to his body, the church. They are unaware of that, of course, and so did not turn in their names to a parish register, as it were. In that respect, they were members in a lesser way or lesser degree. But yet, in a basic and true sense, they were members of the church. Were this not true, St. Paul could not have written, Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Romans chapter 3, verse 29. It is apparent that many of the fathers could say the church existed from the beginning. It was in this way that it did exist. It is also obvious how the Fourth Lateran Council could say flatly that only those who belong to the church are saved. This statement is quite right, since these pagans we have described, who followed the Logos, the Spirit of Christ, really were Christians and were members of the Church. Consequently, there is an answer to what seemed a great puzzle. How can we reconcile the opposing views that one must be a member to be saved, yet many who never get their names on the parish register are saved, now we can have it both ways. Whether or not they realized it, the fathers of Vatican II expressed the same idea. All who belong to Christ, having his spirit, coalesce into one church. But a further objection can be raised. Some say that, before Christ, there was a provision for those who did not know the revelation given to the Jews after Christ, anyone who does not get his name on the parish register, as it were, is damned, even if he had really no chance to get to know the church. This is a horrendous error, really, the most hideous of heresies, for it makes God, who is love, to be a monster, damning untold millions through no fault of their own. On the contrary, St. Paul, in five different ways, repeats in Romans chapter 5, verses 15 to 20, that the redemption is more abundant than the fall. These people would make it far less abundant. 
Further, the words of the magisterium cited above clearly rule out this heresy of the objectors. Pius IX said that God does not allow anyone to be punished with eternal punishments who does not have the guilt of voluntary fault. He was referring to the present, not to the time before Christ, for he used the present tense. Similarly, Vatican II says, They who, without their own fault, do not know the Gospels of Christ and his Church, can be saved if they do what they know. If the council meant only people who formally get into the church, there would be no point in writing these words. Pius XII said to those who were merely ordered to the church by a sort of unrecognized, by them, desire and wish, can be saved. All this does not mean that we should not work and pray for the conversion of those whose names are not on the parish register. We should, definitely. It is will of God that they should enter fully, for there they find more abundant, more secure meanings of salvation. And God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Chapter 24 we have here no lasting city. In chapter 5, the question was posed, If there is a good God, how can there be such evils in the world? We were able to give only a partial answer then, since we could not use Scripture until we have shown that the Scriptures can be trusted, and is even inspired. But we can return to more completely address the question, it was established that evil is not a positive thing, a substance. It is a negative, a lack of what there should be. So evil does not need or have a creator. The worst evils are moral evils. They are permitted by God in an indirect way. That is, the very gift of free will makes such things possible. He could have created a race similar to ours, but lacking free will. But it would not be human, and we really do not want to be without freedom. With regard to moral evil, nature itself strikes those who do wrong with automatic penalties. For example, if someone gets drunk, nature imposes a hangover. If someone grows up being completely self-indulgent, never having discipline, never denying self, such a person will be immature. Marriage is not for children. If one immature person is part of a marriage, that marriage is really apt to fail. Again, the biochemistry of sex can cause feelings of tenderness, but these are not real love. Real love is a deep concern or desire in the spiritual will for the well-being and happiness of the other. Chemistry fools people into thinking they have such a concern, but they really do not. They may think they can cheat by violating moral laws, which only spell out what our nature needs, and later wake up to find themselves locked into a marriage without love. Again, nature strikes without mercy. God is merciful, but nature is not. A failed marriage is one of the great tragedies of life. Something else about the immature and the self-indulgent must be added. They not only are likely to fail at marriage, but they cannot really enjoy life in other respects. And if they go very far into self-indulgence, they may pay a dear penalty at the hands of nature. The great pagan Roman historian Tacitus quotes for us part of a letter from the Emperor Tiberius to the Senate. It was written near the end, 
when Tiberius had corrupted himself at all sorts of terrible excesses. Tiberius wrote, If I know what to write to you at this time, senators, or how to write it, or what not to write, may the gods sink me into an even worse ruin that I feel overtaking me daily. Imagine an all-powerful despot, able to gratify his every whim, feeling this way. Tacitus continues and explains, not in vain was the wisest of men wont to affirm that the souls of despots, if uncovered, would show manglings and wounds, tearing left on the spirit, like lash marks on a body, by cruelty, lust, and malevolence. Neither... Tiberius's power nor isolation could save him from confessing the inner torments of heart, which were his penalty. That wisest of men, to whom Tacitus refers, was Socrates, who, in Plato's Theatetus, says, They, people who try to get away with wrongdoing, do not know the penalty of wickedness, is not beatings and death, which evildoers often escape, but a penalty that cannot be escaped, that they lead a life that matches the pattern to which they are growing like. We have been talking thus far about moral evils, but there is also physical evils, such as sickness, hardships, death. What are these? Many today have lost sight or have never known a tremendous perspective which alone can explain physical evils. St. Paul knew it well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 17-24, through 24, he was explaining to his converts that the fact they had become Christians did not require a change in the externals of their lives. Except, of course things that were sinful. In that context, he makes a statement that is very surprising. Were you called to the faith as a slave? Let it not concern you, but even if you are able to become free, rather use it. The words use it are ambiguous. They could either advise losing the chance to become free or to use the chance for humility as a slave. The fact that Paul is developing the idea that the fact one becomes Christian does not have to mean a change in the externals of his life strongly suggests Paul meant that one should stay a slave. But we see his attitudes on the subject elsewhere. This view is somewhat strengthened. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 to 24, and Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, he tells slaves to obey not only when their masters are watching, but even when they are not looking, and they will be rewarded by Christ. Paul could talk this way because he saw a great vista in which most people do not see. It becomes clearer in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 8. But the things that were gained to me, these I have considered as loss on account of Christ. Furthermore, I count all things to be but loss for the outstandingness of knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as dung, that I may gain Christ. He means that in comparison to having Christ, everything else is worthless, is mere dung. For St. Paul knew that we are saved and made holy if, and to the extent that we are not only members of Christ, but like him. Now the life of Christ, there were two phases. First, there was a hard life, suffering and death. Second, eternal glory. St. Paul knew the more that we are like him in the first place, the more we will be like him in the second, in glory.
In such a perspective, St. Paul, without meaning to approve slavery, could still think of it little moment. But now we must ask why Christ chose such a life, for he, in his divine nature, could and did choose every detail of his earthly life. The answer is twofold. Such things are good for us and are needed for reparation of sin. Why needed for us? Human nature includes both body and soul, and within each there are many drives and needs. So Jesus took on a heavy measure of the things to induce us to do what is good for us, and as a reparation for sin. But there is more. St. Paul knew we need these things for the present life, but we need them still more for the life to come because greater likeness to life here means greater likeness to his glory. How satisfactory is this present life? At best, it is short and includes many things that are unpleasant. Suppose we think back to second grade. How long did a school year seem then compared to a year now? So it is for all normal persons, as we age, time picks up speed. A span of fifty years seem long before we started. But when it is over, it seems like little. Further, we contrast this short and not-too-satisfactory life with an unending span, including satisfaction and happiness beyond our ability to imagine it. No wonder St. Paul took the attitude, why worry about your situation here? The important thing is to get the best possible in the future life. For St. Paul knew that thanks to the goodness of God, these present evils, which human frailty in a material world make inevitable, can be turned into pure gold for that unending glorious life. The very fatherliness of God leads him to give us this training and preparation. Earthly parents who are always indulgent to children do them ill service because they stay immature and are unable to enjoy life as they should. They are in danger of failed marriages and of eternal misery. In the book of Proverbs, in the Old Testament, we read... Chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. My son, reject not the correction of the Lord. Do not faint when you are chastised by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastises. And as a father in the son, he takes pleasure. So difficulties are really a sight of special love. God is preparing us more fully, more surely, for that life that really counts. The epistle to the Hebrews says the same thing in chapter 12, verse 6. For whom the Lord loves, he chastises, and he scourges every son whom he accepts. Further, on the more positive side, St. Paul tells us that even small, difficult things now bring a reward out of proportion later for that which is at present momentarily and light of our troubles is working beyond all measure an eternal weight of glory for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. And again in Romans chapter 8, verse 18 for I judge that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come. That shall be revealed to us. St. Augustine, in his Confessions, spoke to God, saying, You have made us for yourself, and restless is our heart until it rests in you. Augustine knew this because he had tried illegitimate pleasures to excess, yet found none of them really satisfying. 
How many times have we looked forward to an event only to be let down or disappointed after its arrival? Somehow the reality is less than our anticipation of it and does not fully satisfy. No earthly pleasure provides the happily ever after we seek. Even sex, the most intense of pleasures, becomes routine and people try to recapture lost intensity through sex manuals or unnatural perversions. The only thing that can really fill us, make us utterly happy, and will never grow old or monotonous is the sharing of the life of God himself. For each animal, God has provided satisfaction proper to its species. But for men, he was not content to provide a merely human kind of happiness. He made us enjoy being part divine. This phrase, part divine, is not rhetoric, poetry, or exaggeration. It is most strictly true. The second epistle of St. Peter, chapter 1, verse 4, says we are partakers of the divine nature. The first epistle of John speaks similarly, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. We are now the sons of God, and it has not yet appeared what we shall be. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like to him, because we shall see him. As he is, we are his children by adoption. In human adoption, a good couple takes in a child and treats it as if it were a natural member of the family, yet they cannot give the child any of the genes or blood. It is only by a legal document that he is called their child. But what human couples cannot do, God can and does. He not only calls us his sons, he gives us a share in his own life, very literally. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, a great father of the church, compared this transformation of our souls by grace to a piece of iron in a blacksmith's forge. At first the iron is cold and dark, but when it warms up in the fire... It finally gr glows so that it seems to have turned into fire. Another good example is of a diamond that could float in the air in the brilliant noontime summer sun so that it would seem to have been changed into the sun. But these are only comparisons and do not get to the literal heart of the matter. St. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, we see now through a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Mirrors then did not have the brilliance of ours. Similarly, in this life we know God only in a dark manner, through the mirror of creation. Whatever good there must be in him in the supreme degree, mirrors then did not have the brilliance of ours. Similarly, in this life, we know God only in a dark manner, through the mirror of creation. Whatever good there is must be in him in the supreme degree, for he made it. But in the world to come, we will see him face to face. That is, of course, a figure of speech. What does it mean literally? When I see you, I do not take you into my head. I take in an image of you. Now an image is finite or limited, but so are you. Hence an image can let me see you well, but no image, since images have to be finite, could let me see God. Hence Pope Benedict XII defined that when we see God, there is no image at all in between him and us. How can that be? St. Thomas Aquinas made the obvious addition. If there is no image, then God must join himself directly to our intellect to do the work of an image. That is really 
seeing face to face. Now, this sort of vision is possible only for a creature that is part divine. Within the Blessed Trinity, there are two infinite streams of knowledge and love. Chapter 1 of St. John's Gospel tells us that the Father speaks a word. That word is not the quickly passing vibration of the air that our words are. No, it is substantial and it fully expresses him. In a divine person, the word, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, that is the infinite stream of knowledge, that is a divine person. Between these divine persons that arises an infinite love, again, that love is no mere vibration, but is substantial. It is, again, a person, the Holy Ghost, who is the love of the Father for the Son and the Son for the Father. Can it ever become dull as events in daily life in these infinite streams? Of course not. We are finite. They are infinite, and hence inexhaustible. A modern writer, J.P. Arinsden, gives us a comparison that is helpful. God, then, remains unfathomable even to the greatest of his saints. They see him, but none can see to the very depths of his divine being. God is a world, a wide universe, which none of the blesseds had ever totally explored. Even after millions of cycles of ages, neither Mary, the Queen of Heaven, nor Michael, the Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, shall exhaust the greatness of this divine majesty. It is an ocean on which the little craft of created intelligence can forever press forward in all directions, for it is a sea without a shore. It is necessary to note that we are finite vessels trying to take in the infinite, but these vessels, our souls, can be enlarged to be capable of taking in God more and more fully, even though no one can exhaust the vision. Each soul will be completely full and satisfied, having all it can contain. Yet some can contain more than others. To make us capable of containing more is the work of suffering in this life. Thus, if our Father gives us more difficult tasks, it means he wants us to have ever greater joy forever. And to return to St. Paul, his generosity is such that whatever is light and momentary in our troubles is working beyond all measure an eternal weight of glory for us. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 So that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come, that shall be revealed to us. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 The marvelous story of a modern woman illustrates this. Martha Robin was a simple peasant woman in southern France who died on February 6, 1981. For more than 50 years she had been blind and paralyzed, unable to move in her bed. In 1930 she had received the sacred stigmata and she went through the Passion every Friday. She never ate anything or even drank a drop of water for more than 50 years. Although difficult for us to believe, she lived solely on the Holy Eucharist. In spite of her afflictions, she was always patient, gentle, peaceful, humble, joyful, charitable, self-giving, and interested in others. She really could say with St. Paul, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up those things that are wanting for the sufferings of Christ in my flesh for his body, which is the church. Colossians chapter 1 verse 24 If what is light and momentary in affliction works an eternal weight of glory, what of such a soul? Her sufferings 
were a privilege for her in the church. The sane man sees things as they are and reacts appropriately. The sane man sees things as they are not. He may think someone is chasing him, or that he is Napoleon, etc. Within this framework, who is the sanest of men? He who sees this world as it is, as no lasting city, but as the waiting room where we await our flight to our real home. This person is not too concerned with affairs in the waiting room or with accumulating all sorts of baggage. No, his concern is to get home, to enjoy home most fully. Hence it is that the saints were the sanest people, the only totally sane people, because they saw this world as it is and reacted appropriately. St. Paul said that in comparison to what is to come, this world is mere dung. Philippians chapter 3 verse 3 On which we should set no store, knowing that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come, and that shall be revealed to us. Romans chapter 8 verse 18